That's right, everybody. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your podcast or your live stream of choice. I'm your host, John Greenwald Jr., founder and creator of theblackvault.com. And at least this time, the live stream went out with a little bit less of a hitch than last time. As I still learn this software, you'll have to be patient with me as we go through this particular live stream, because who knows what can happen? Yes, this is live. Uh, you'll know that I do on this channel. If you've been around for a long time, sometimes I do live premieres, but they are pre-recorded videos. Right now, I'm absolutely live. So anything can happen. I'm an OCD perfectionist, so if I mess up, it'll throw me off, and then I'll start crying. It'll be really embarrassing. But with that being said, what we are going to do in this video today is number one, go over the two stories that I went through on Friday. Now, when I did this a couple of weeks ago, what I was amazed by was the, the fact that many of you had said you don't use social media. I had kind of half made a joke about it. And then I saw all these comments and even private messages and emails saying thank you because a lot of people just said goodbye to social media, no Twitter, no Facebook. And I was surprised to see that. So these stories may be brand new to you. If you do follow me on social media, you read the articles on Friday, but now's the the chance for me to kind of open up a little bit about what's going on and, and, and what happened and kind of update you guys. I won't read everything word for word. So in the description, if you're watching on YouTube and hopefully on Facebook and Twitter and so on, the, this will be the same. But in the description below, you will see some links that will link over to the stories that I am referencing. A lot more written detail, obviously, in that. And then we'll go over some visuals and stuff and have fun uh, in the presentation now. After that, I'll update you guys on both stories. I'll do it as quick as I can, but I'll open up the phone lines. What I realized on Friday was that there was a lot of questions. Some were, um, I would say, more controversial than I thought, meaning they were stemming from what I did not realize. And this is the honest to God truth. I didn't realize the story about the UAP report would be as controversial and, and create kind of a social media firestorm a bit if you're involved in, in those debates. Uh, I was a little surprised at that. I knew there would be a reaction, but I didn't think it would be that, I guess, intense. Uh, and so, you know, sand started throwing and this and that. Some people were really upset. Some were surprised. Uh, others just don't believe anything that I have to say, which is fine, too. Uh, but that but that uh, being said, what I'm going to go over to uh, go over with you guys is show you the evidence and show you the sourced material. Uh, that's not an endorsement. And let me say that right up front before we get into it. Anything that I report on, not only now, but in general, uh, you know, in, in, in this really kind of deals with everything, but mostly with UFOs, because those stories get the most press, the most uh, traffic and, and, and the most attention. It's not an endorsement. And, and I'm surprised that I have to say that, but I have to say it. So just because I bring forward evidence, it doesn't mean I believe it. It doesn't mean I doubt it. What I look for is the actual evidence. And, and that's what we're going to go over. So let me go ahead and bring up some visuals. That is the first story I want to talk about. Again, this being the more controversial of the two. And that is the reality that the UAP report, the classified version, was only 17 pages. Now, we know that the, the public version was nine. All right, that that's a given. We were all let down, myself included. Uh, I am uh, the first to admit when I read it, I was let down. But but I won't go over all of that again, because there's already a video on this channel. So if you haven't seen that, I recommend after this, go back, read it, or excuse me, watch it, then you can read my original write up on it, you can see uh, essentially my reaction, I was let down with you guys. But after reading it a couple times kind of turned around a little bit, it was a little bit more important than I originally thought. So now fast forward, okay, public reports been out to quickly update you on that other video, which goes into more more uh, a depth. Essentially, let me see here. Where did I, I lost my, see, I knew there'd be a blunder. There it is. All right, couldn't find my slide changer there for a second. So here's the quick, uh, I would say, summation of what that video is. You guys mostly know me as the Freedom of Information Act guy. Freedom of Information Act let, lets you create cases, request information from the government, 
and essentially ask for information and hopefully get it. So if it doesn't fit into nine different categories, it, they'll release it. That's the nutshell version. I didn't do that with this. This was filed under the Code of Federal Regulations, Part 1704 in Chapter 32. This is essentially the program for what's called a mandatory declassification review for the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Now, that's a mouthful. Say that five times fast. Uh, essentially, what that means is you can request a document to be declassified, and it does not matter the age. It does not, not matter uh, the topic. It doesn't matter the agency. Every different agency has this program, and if you know how to do it, you create the case, and that initiates a mandatory declassification review. And with ODNI being the one that published this specific report to the Senate, the classified version, that is who I targeted. Let me stop for a second and say, Erwin Fletcher, $25, thank you so much. The world is a better place for having people like John Cremald Jr. in it, along with so many other fighters for the truth. Thank you, good sir. Erwin, thank you. And, and for all those watching, uh, just know all of that uh, super chat, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, that's a huge support to this channel. 100% of it goes back in. We do software upgrades. You'll see f footage being licensed, music being licensed. All of that stuff is is um, is done legit, and, and it's done with the support of people like you and Erwin here. So, Erwin, thank you very, very much for that. So, uh, continuing on with the MDR program. So, that's Saturday morning after I filed for, uh, or excuse me, after the Saturday morning after they published the report, I filed that MDR to get the classified version released. That next week, I had confirmation with a case number. I had the confirmation that the document was in hand, and they were already coordinating with the other agencies that were involved in the report. So they have to coordinate with everybody who contributed material. They are considered what's called the OCA, or Original Classifying Authority, and they have to pretty much coordinate with all of them to make sure that when they release the document to me, fingers crossed, or at least a portion thereof, uh, everybody is cleared and everybody is on the same page. ODNI then releases the document. Jetboy33, you've been a longtime contributor to this channel and, and really do appreciate that support. Thank you very, very much for that. So I had confirmation that all of that is going through. And now, as the, the case has now progressed, so this is the new stuff, I'm communicating with the team that processes that MDR request. In this particular case, it is the same office that processes FOIAs. Now, some agencies, that is true. Other agencies, it is not. So if you start dabbling in this, just know you're going to add an extra layer of confusion to an already confusing process, which is essentially sometimes you're dealing with the FOIA office, other times you're dealing with attorneys and legal offices, and it's a, a, a completely different process. So just know you're, you're, you're adding a little bit of confusion in there, but it is well worth it. Well, during the... Um, during the process of an MDR, let me show you just a, a kind of a quick, a quick example of an MDR success. When you do something through FOIA, let's say in the year 2000, they release the document. If I request that same document in 2021, they'll give me the same redactions. You'll see that on the left hand of your screen. Let me pull up a laser pointer and see if this translates perfect. So this here would be an older released document. If you file the FOIA again, again, they'll just keep sending this particular document with the same redactions. I filed an MDR for this particular record. Topics are relevant. That's a whole nother video in itself. So don't worry if you can't read it. it. It's irrelevant to the conversation, but more so I'm looking visually. You can see all these redactions are gone. And it was because of the case that I filed under Executive Order 13526 to get this information declassified. This particular one was through uh, the NSA. So the National Security Agency lifted all those redactions. So you get a lot more material, you get a lot more uh, information, and it is well worth it. A Little bit of an extra trouble, confusion layered on top of confusion, as I mentioned, but very, very well worth it. Jazz Shaw, 
a, a personal friend, but also longtime contributor to this. Thank you for that. His comment, the reptilians haven't approved this broadcast. John may disappear at any time. The first part of that may or may not be true. I cannot confirm nor deny. The latter part is absolutely true. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But Jazz, as always, a great person. Always fun to have you in the chat. And thank you for that. So you can see, obviously, MDR works. And I have a lot of success stories on this. But there's also a lot of failures, meaning you, you try and get absolutely nothing. Back to the classified report, because there's a lot of questions on this and I want to deal with it. I'm not going to go through the entire request and the case that I filed, but this is the most important language. I'm seeking the classified annex or report or any other material that was given to Congress slash Senate on or around June 25th, 2021. Now, let me break that down for those who want to learn a little bit more about this process, because I think it's important. A lot of times you may think if you just file and say, give me the classified annex, that'll be good enough. And it's not. The reason is, is because, yes, even though we have to be careful playing the semantics game and always accusing the, the government of playing these semantics, there is some truth to it. So you have to make sure that you ask for things properly. And so for me, I go broad. And yes, that's an ugly sentence. Any grammar, any grammar hounds out there is a better way to put that. Uh, any grammar hounds out there, yeah, th that's ugly. But what it does is it covers your bases. So if it's not an annex, but rather a report, right, I've got that covered. If there's other material that went along with it, or was other material that was classified that wasn't a report or an annex, but they call it something else, it's covered, other material. Let's say they delivered something early. Let's say they delivered it late. And I said, give, it, give me what you guys gave to the Senate on the 25th of June. Well, what happened if it goes to the 26th or the 24th? That's covered. So you essentially do circa or, or around or whatever you like to, to say grammar wise, but it covers your basis, right? And so this really kind of puts it out there that in case there's any concern from any of you that are watching, yes, that does mean everything. Now, you know me, I cover my bases. I did talk to ODNI uh, verbally and confirmed that, yes, uh, if there was any other material in addition to the report, that my case would cover it. Here is the root of the essentially the headline. This was the story on Friday, short and sweet, clear as day. This was a, a communication regarding my case. The one handling it and, and my main contact is the chief in charge of everything over there with the information review and release group. She's also a FOIA public liaison for ODNI. So essentially, she's you can't get higher when it comes to the reviewer. She's the chief. She's the she's a, a, a great person to deal with. I have zero complaints. She is when I make reference to FOIA people and and and, and MDR teams and so on that want to help. Uh, she definitely has struck me as someone who wants to help. So she has been very communicative. She has answered my questions and so on and so forth. So with that, I want to give a respectful shout out to Sally Nicholson. Now, her name is here. I, I, I was cleared to publish it, right? It's a public record. But out of respect for those who were quick to read my article, uh, it was originally blurred. And the reason was, is I wanted to ask her to publish her name. The reason I didn't is her agency usually doesn't attribute to the name. It attributes to the agency. And so out of respect to her, because I didn't want her to get blasted by everybody asking UFO questions, blurred it. However, after I published, uh, we, we got in contact again and she's like, oh yeah, it's not a problem. That statement is from me. Spokespeople are a little bit different at ODNI. We don't publish when we publish a statement we attribute it to a person we don't do that uh we we publish it and attribute it to the actual agency every agency is different remember talk about those layers of confusion that that's one element of it the classified version of the report is 17 pages in length you can't get more cut and dry than that now, the classified version of the report ties back to the language that I already told you. So whether it be the annex, the report, or any other material, my case has yielded 17 pages. What I have confirmation on is those are being reviewed. Now, another big question that I want to deal with 
is whether or not the report had media attached. Now, whether that would be a DVD with 300 videos, whether that would be four hours of UFO footage that'll knock your socks off, whether that be 40 minutes, I think I heard rambled around. I don't know. Um, would my request include it? I have confirmed. The answer is yes. Was there something that would be attached to these 17 pages and they will not confirm that? So I have no confirmation or decline that that is real or not. So with that, I want to stress it. There's 17 pages, but if there's other media attached, I'll find that out later. But because as it currently stands, the classified report that was handed over that totals 17 pages, right now it is not told if there's additional material in the form of color printed photographs, DVDs of videos, so on and so forth. So I don't have an answer there, so keep that open. So it's not like it's 17 pages and that's it. It might be, but we're not sure yet. But that's where we are at with that particular case. Now, here's the controversy. And before I get there, Esteban Corio, thank you very much for that. Uh, and the super sticker, I don't, I can't, I can't tell what that is. So I apologize, Esteban, but thank you for that. I don't know if that's you or something else, but I do appreciate your support of the channel. Thank you very, very much for that. And all others, I am keeping a, a watch on the chat. It's going to be very hard with questions. There's a lot of you in the room right now. Uh, by my stats here, I'm looking at over 630 people currently watching. I've got a lot of comments going through on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. It's very hard to watch that. The super chats, though, I'm paying attention to those. Any questions that come in, I will highlight them. If I miss them, I'll apologize in advance, uh, but I'm doing my best there. So thank you, guys. Truly, truly appreciate it. So the controversy, for those who aren't aware or follow this daily, this is where I was a little surprised. Yes, I thought it would be controversial to a point. I didn't realize quite the level that people would get heated about the page count. I called it page count gate, hashtag page count gate on Twitter, because it came into essentially kind of a rumble between some layers of hashtag UFO Twitter, if you follow that. If you pay attention to some of the people in the know, there have been varying degrees of levels of this report that people with authority, speaking with authority, are saying either from firsthand experience or through anonymous sources and multiple sources they won't name, that the report of the classified annex has been 74 pages, 400 pages, 70 pages, and 78 pages. Now, those are only the ones that I would consider those that are speaking with authority. The only one that I pay attention to would be Luis Elizondo. And that would be here when he said it was 74 pages. Now, I am not here, again, to repeat it, to endorse ODNI. However, they are putting a sourced name to the claim. It is involved in a legal case. And it essentially is the result of the language I've already read to you for my MDR case. And they have put it on the table that that is 17 pages. Now, this is not a spokesperson department. This is not Susan Goff. A lot of you thought that Susan Goff gave me this. Uh, she did not. This has nothing to do with, with the DOD or OSD or the same team that has given us the UAP slash UFO slash Luis Elizondo slash ATIP comments for the last couple of years. Nothing to do with that. This is involved with a legal case that I am involved in through that federal regulation that, that the, the code of federal regulations that I went over that I'm involved in. So if there is evidence to show that ODNI is misleading me, that's a bigger problem than what people think. A spokesperson lies to you or they skew the truth. Yeah, that really stinks. And sure, we can create you know online petitions and file all the complaints we want. But it's a little bit different when you're talking about, a, a um, you know, I'm, I'm not suing them. It, it's not that kind of a case, but rather one filed under this this federal regulation that 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 essentially demands a mandatory declassification review of the document. So if somebody has evidence to the contrary and somebody can tell me with authority and verifiable proof 
that it's more than that. I'm all ears. The problem is, is that no one has yet. And I go back to the Luis Elizondo thing. Some people thought that I was taking a shot at him with this paragraph. Uh, I'm No, I'm not. I linked to his interview because that is a verifiable source of where that 74 page estimate came from. I linked to Danny Sheehan's interview, which happens to be Luis Elizondo's attorney. How he got 400 pages is beyond me. I don't know. Um, I've reached out to Danny. We have played a little bit of email tag, so he's not ignoring me or anything. We just haven't touched base yet. Um, but maybe there'll be a correction to that 400 pages. But all of these hyperlink to the to the claims that are being made. So that's not a shot towards Mr. Elizondo. That's not a shot towards Danny Sheehan. It's not that I'm saying ODN, uh, ODNI is right and I'm betting my house on it. This is just the story that we are involved in, that we're all entrenched in trying to figure out the truth about what really has happened with this UAP report and why in whomever's name, there are so many people speaking on authority about the report with secret sources and so on, and they have a wildly varying degree of page counts. But again, I go back to Luis Elizondo to me as being somebody that if they, if anybody knows something, it's Mr. Elizondo. So if he's got evidence, I'm all I'm all ears. Uh, if for those who really pay attention on Twitter, I, I'd like everybody to know if you haven't seen it. Yes, I did reach out to him this last week on these stories. The only reason he wasn't in them is that, and it's not for me to say why, was unable to contribute by the time that I was going to publish. That's it. There was nothing malicious. I did contact him, him and those who work with him can vouch for that. Uh, I contacted and reached out to him prior to publishing anything. But I would imagine if he was able to cite a different source or why he knows or whatever, he will or or would have put it out by now or will in the future. So I'm not going to continue to hound him. Um, I'm just going to follow the evidence and, and see where we end up. And and that's that's essentially, you know, all I can do. And and profile it along the way. And as new evidence comes forth, I will profile that as well, show you guys and go from there. Event Tide, thank you very, very much for that. I know it took me a couple of minutes to thank you, but uh, I, I saw that go through and uh, thank you for that support of the channel. Very, very much appreciated. So with the varying degrees of, of page counts, here's what I would... Um, Here's what I would say what I think happened. And let me get this off the screen really quick. I think a plausible explanation, and I do not have firsthand or secondhand or thirdhand information. This is just a guess. But what I think may have happened is that there probably was a draft of some kind of what would eventually become what is handed over to the Senate in a classified realm. And that maybe was over 70 pages. Let me read to you this this top part here. It's getting a little cut off uh, by the graphics, but ODNI prepared this report for the Congressional Intelligence and Armed Services Committee, the UAP Task Force, and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, National Intelligence Manager for Aviation, drafted this report with input from USDINS, DIA, and I won't go through the whole list. Why that's important is that we don't know if this report was the first and final draft. We don't know if, let's say, the UAPTF created a 70 plus page report, sent it over to ODNI. And so, like, that's a starting point. The National Intelligence Manager for Aviation, which, by the way, I went over this in the last video, I think, but happens to be United States Air Force. So the one military branch that's been mum about this entire topic happens to be one of the final people that wrote it. So what's up with that? And I'm still looking into that. But the National Intelligence Manager for Aviation, uh, Major General, I believe, uh, is his rank from the United States Air Force. They drafted the report. But again, we don't know if they cut down that 70 plus pages that maybe the UAPTF drafted and then it came down to 17 pages that were either top secret or secret. 
Because let's face it, the Senate ain't going to read 70 pages. It doesn't matter if it's 70 or 700. Generally, they're not going to read it. They, they, they sign bills that are 100 times the length and never read it. We know that. So, so I, I think it's safe to say that in this particular case, they probably, you know, sorry, senators, dumbed it way down and took what may be more technical stuff, uh, more background about the technology, the sensors, the this, the that, and then just whittled it down into 17 pages. The sensitive slash classified material gets cut out and then put in is the, uh, then, then that is published in a public version, which is the unclassified version at nine pages. Now that's speculation. I want to stress that but it makes sense. So if Mr. Elizondo, and I don't know his contacts, I'm only assuming that he has contacts. Uh, if he's working with the UAPTF, uh, again, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of unanswered questions here. I know he's alluded to working with them. The Pentagon says, no, he's not. I'll let you guys decide on who's telling the truth. But if he's not actively involved and he, and he knows people over there and they're telling him, could it be that he has sources or friends or he's consulting with the UAPTF and then it goes over to ODNI and they go, no, 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 70 pages, way too much. Take this out, take this out, take this out, take this out. And then you end up with a 17 page final report. Plausible. Absolutely. Truth have no idea. So we'll, we'll find out. But again, I want to stress with my case, cause I'm going to move on to the second story. Now with my case, if there is any evidence verifiable that that there is a bigger report and I am being lied to, all you got to do is show evidence. I'll do all the work and finance the case myself. If I have to appeal, I've already written an appeal, by the way, if it's fully denied, but that will be used in the appeal process. If the appeal process fails, you better believe that I'll look at judicial review because I believe that based on these numbers alone, I have a really good case to get the majority of it. Even though we don't lo lo uh, learn anything new, if they try and pull the whole, nope, sorry, it's all classified, I believe there's a case to be put up. That is a different video for another day. But regardless, I need the evidence to show that they're lying. If that 17 pages is wrong, then my article, which had the name source with an agency letterhead and a legal case attached, if that is all based on a lie, someone needs to step up and play some evidence on the table because a tweet from an anonymous account doesn't work. A pinky swear doesn't work. And with respect to Mr. Elizondo, just because he says it uh, in a radio interview uh, with respect to everybody involved, including him, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't. It doesn't mean nothing until there is evidence to back it up. That's the only thing that means something to someone like me, not because I'm demanding it, it's because in the eyes of the law and the federal regulations that afforded me the opportunity to do this, that demands it. So that's what I mean by that. Let's move on to the second story. And thank you all, by the way, for tuning in. The um, software, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, is brand new. So I'm still kind of learning everything. It's, it's very easy. The software I used before was very complicated. And when you get used to something complicated and then it gets simplified, man, it gets brutal to try and to try and adapt. Um, but uh, let me move on to the second story before I do joke to self uh, via YouTube doesn't format font size spacing, etc. affect page count. You rock, John. Thank you. Joke to self. Great question. Uh, that. Um, that's a great question. Let me let me deal with that. But first, uh, let me thank you for that support for this channel. If you're just tuning in, all of this support goes into making these types of videos and the cases that I file and going after the documents and so on. So thank you guys for supporting the channel. Does the font size and spacing affect the page count? Absolutely. But if we're talking the difference between font size 10 or 12 or 14, you probably aren't going to go smaller or bigger than that. Will it go to what, 20 pages, 30 pages, maybe, uh, but you're probably not going to go above 70. Even if you double that, I still don't think you're, you're, you're at the mark either, meaning 
you know, increase the font size to thir- uh, 13, you know, and, and, and double space it. And will that make 17 pages turn into uh, 74, I think was the lower end, all the way up to 400? In my opinion, no. Could you make it work? I'm sure you could. So is is that what we're playing with here? I doubt it. I, I mean, I, I think that we're that we're potentially trying to stretch to, to get to the 70 pages. I truly think that what's happening here is maybe a difference between a draft document and a final report. One other thing I didn't mention before I do move on is the idea that it was an executive summary of the bigger report. And I want to kind of dispel that myth until evidence is presented to me. You'll notice that the language that I filed is... Uh, it never makes mention to a summary or executive summary or anything like that. It was essentially the entire classified annex or report that was sent over to the Senate. So I never stipulated, give me an executive summary or anything like that. How that is defined in a case like this, that would not allow them the opportunity to only take the executive summary and then take that 70 other pages and then, you know, sweep it under the carpet and say, no, no, no. Don't don't tell Greenwald about that. It's just not how that works. Could they do it? Sure. F- fine. Maybe I need evidence to show otherwise. Like if I go to them and say this, you know, anonymous account on Twitter said it's 78 pages or Luis Elizondo says that it's 74 or, you know, whatever, that's not going to work. There needs to be a verifiable source. And and that's what you need in an appeal. Uh, I have gone over on this channel, but I'll quickly say it, and, and this won't make some people happy. I have used Mr. Elizondo's publicly available, uh, we'll call it testimony, about ATIP and, and UAPs and so on in a FOIA appeal, which does go to the legal departments of all the agencies at hand. In this particular case, the United States Navy denied my appeal and specifically footnoted the denial on Luis Elizondo's testimony, linking back to a news article that referenced a Pentagon statement saying that he played no, uh, had no assigned responsibilities in ATIP. We all know that statement. My whole point with bringing that up is the fact that from a legal standpoint, they dismissed me using that as evidence. So it doesn't matter if I believe it or not. It doesn't matter if I support the Pentagon or not. All that matters is they support the Pentagon and they dismissed it. So that's what I mean. That's not me being mean to people, but they will dismiss it and they need evidence as well. So hopefully that answered your question and then also expanded a little bit on the executive summary. So here's the second story I published on Friday. A little bit drier. It's not as fun and exciting, so I probably won't spend as much time. In my opinion, it's more important. It opens up a much bigger issue than what the original story was. Now, I'm shifting gears just a little bit, but sticking with the same person. This ties into a story I wrote about seven weeks ago or so about Luis Elizondo and his Department of Defense official emails and at least eight or nine years of them. Plus, over the course of two years, to kind of quickly summarize this story, I had filed at least eight FOIA cases, most of which were all denied that they had no records. All the cases were about Luis Elizondo's emails. And what I was going for was a search on his emails for specific keywords. The one that I'll use as a specific example, which uh, was ultimately where all of this was revealed, was a search of all of Luis Elizondo's emails for the keyword unidentified. That was it. No other stipulation. No date timestamp, no unidentified flying object, no nothing. It came back as no records. I confirmed and have the paper trail to prove, did you guys, and I asked the DOD, did you guys search Sippernet, Nippernet, and JWix, which essentially would be all levels of classification, as Mr. Elizondo was working with DOD and communicating on classified levels. I got confirmation. Yes, they did. So I appealed, won my appeal. They did another search. That appeal revealed that they deleted everything. The date is unknown when they deleted it. 
I had cases in for his emails going back to at least 2018, I believe it was. And the and some of those cases would go to no records and I didn't have grounds for an appeal. The unidentified ones, I had grounds for appeal just because that's more of a basic keyword. Yes, it ties into UFOs, but you know, let's just say he's talking to a work buddy or something and saying there's this unidentified substance in my cafeteria food today. Did you see that or something silly, you know, but never in, in nearly a decade using the word unidentified. That didn't make sense. So that's that's what my appeal revealed that they deleted everything. Well, I continued after I wrote that story, continued to pursue it. I gave them literally months to answer. And about a week after I published, and there's a reason I didn't immediately publish this, but a week after I published that article, I got additional language that was approved that I was waiting for months for. Then I published, I'll, voila, it all of a sudden appears. And it created more questions than it did give me answers. And what was really frustrating about that was I waited months for them to tell me something that I feel did not apply. Now, why is, is all of this, you know, essentially important? And it's important because not only does Luis Elizondo have this controversial past, right? That the Pentagon wants to, wants to tarnish. He want, they, they want to throw mud in the water and, and dirty his reputation. We all know that. I mean, that's what they're doing, whether it's true or not let you guys decide, but that's what they're doing. They've called him out by name, said he's not doing things that he said he did. So that's why part of this is important. But the other part I'll get into in just a couple of minutes. And if you haven't heard the story, to me, it's pretty fascinating on how that this could happen, but more so why it's allowed to happen and nobody's doing anything about it. Here's the language. I'm going to drop this down to a podcast, so I'm going to read it to you. It is showing you on screen there on YouTube. This is the language that I waited weeks for, excuse me, months for, but then waited another six weeks to try and get even further clarification. None ever came. Let me read it to you. After further coordination with the Defense Information Systems Agency, or DISA, the record custodian for the electronic mail correspondence sought in your request. We were advised of the following procedures. If the user left OSD in 2017, but is still working in the DOD, meaning they are still using their at mail.mil email, then there is a chance those emails still exist. If they left the DOD entirely in 2017 and haven't used their at mail.mil email since then, they, or the emails, would be gone unless the user was journaled. A journaled account is an optional DOD enterprise email or DEE service that provides mission partners the ability to retain all messages and their attachments sent to and from high ranking and other designated uh, individuals whose email may contain official records, which are subject to legal and regulatory requirements. Messages in journaled accounts are preserved for 10 years. Please note that the that generally journaled accounts are top tier leadership, SES, HON, three to four star generals, admirals. The accounts of some employees with unique jobs may also be journaled. Generally, the determination of which accounts are selected to be journaled is made at the organizational level responsible for the accounts creation. Lastly, DEE or mail.mil or mail.smil.mil. Those are the secure level of communications, by the way. So when they use like, let's say JWix, it's, it's a different address. That's what those are. Lastly, DEE keeps emails for 120 days after inactivity, after which they are deleted. If the user has a journaled account, then their emails are kept for 10 years. For non-journaled users, and users are able to self-archive and delete email from their mailboxes. Such mail remains on the DEE servers for up to 14 days, even if permanently deleted is selected in the deleted items folder. This may be overwritten by DEE after 60 days. All right, so that's the end quote. Sorry, that's a mouthful, but I wanted the audio version to hear it. Here's the problem. Who are they blaming? Now they're, they're doubling down on this story. They're blaming Luis Elizondo. He was the director of the National Program Special Management Staff, or NPSMS. So essentially his department that he headed, which is not in dispute. No one has ever disputed that Pentagon or otherwise. He essentially would would make that decision, 
right? And, and so they're blaming him. But here's the problem with all of this is I truly just do not believe that they would allow it to happen. They meaning the DOD. The DOD is a huge infrastructure with employees that fit in all sorts of different categories. And yes, it gets confusing as all heck, but all those different categories have a different timetable on when their information should be deleted, when it should be retained, or when it should be transferred over to the National Archives for preservation and perpetuity, meaning forever. They claimed, but I can find no evidence, that the DOD is trained on this, which could very well be true. But how can the DOD completely trust that gigantic infrastructure of contractors, civilian employees, enlisted airmen, and enlisted men and women? How could that all, they just put the trust of top secret, secret, confidential, and even unclassified information in the hands of their giant infrastructure? That doesn't make any sense to me because not everybody that works in the DOD, God bless them, is an IT person that understands the ins and outs of data backup when you talk about emails, chat transcripts, attachments, and 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 uh, and so on. How could they know all of that? Is it all in their training? Great. I asked them to produce it. They couldn't. I asked them to produce the rules that mandated that they were the ones in charge. They couldn't do that either. In fact, I didn't get anything. Now, here's the proof. The director of the National Program Special Management Staff, this is Luis Elizondo's resignation letter originally came out as a leak, but he's never denied that it was real. And everybody started talking about it like it was real. And then it wound up on the history channel. So I guess it's real. <laughs> it was on his show and he didn't have a problem with it. So that's his resignation letter. That title there is something that intrigued me since it leaked out back in 2019. I'll go over this part quickly because I do have other videos where I go much more at length. This is a court transcript from the trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the 9-11 mastermind. It's one of the only official documents, although, spoiler alert, I actually have one more as of about a week ago. So I've been working on this for years now on his office. So I'm not trying to tease you, but rather this is still an on ongoing, this is still an ongoing saga to try and figure out the truth behind the NPSMS. But here's a, here's a part of the transcript and the NPS, uh, MS is the office. It states the NPSMS is the office responsible for administering the special access program for the office of military commissions. Does that sound right to you? This is again, was the dialogue with the, with the judge and so on. And what happened was the translator that was working for the attorneys of KSM, they needed access to essentially this, the sensitive and classified information that they could give KSM a proper defense. And they lost that access. And it was Luis Elizondo or his office, one of the two or both, that was the one that orchestrated all of that. Now, in my interview with him, I got him to at least say that, and he's spoken about this elsewhere too, that he played a role in, in Gitmo uh, and, and that portfolio, but has, has not spoken about it at all. So I originally came out with this in 2019 before Mr. Elizondo and I ever really met and spoke directly. And, and put that out there that um, his office did a lot more than just UFOs, if that's what he did. There is a lot more here, and this has really, really intrigued me uh, to no end. Now, now knowing that and seeing the court transcripts, there's more, by the way. The other video I did has much more about it and, and so on and so forth. But it shows that Luis Elizondo and, Hor and or his department would have played a role in that. This is what they originally told me in their letter when they said everything was destroyed. Please note that emails of former Department of Defense employees are not retained unless they are considered historical records and retained by the National Records Center. Here's kind of the problem that I have with that explanation in April of this year. And then I, I read you the one that was the most recent. The one in the most recent, they blame the employee. But how does an employee know if their emails are historically significant? They shouldn't be the ones that make that decision. I would think that you'd have somebody higher, right? Some oversight that talks about the retention of records. What if somebody's walked off the property because they're involved in some IG investigation 
and they're going to get fired. And they never step foot inside the Pentagon again. What happens? There's no one there to take care of the data. If they didn't hit journaled when they're getting led out in handcuffs, all that data is gone. None of that makes sense whatsoever. And on top of that, they're, they, the DOD, is really going to try and pass off that their massive data infrastructure with all those emails, attachments, sensitive records, so on and so forth, is, is just at the mercy that technology is going to work right. And let's hope that everybody does proper backups and journals their accounts. Or is it more plausible that they do massive backups, whether it be by department or by component or wh whatever that is? I don't have that information. But the DOD is really going to say that they just have zero backups whatsoever, that they don't keep backups of information for more than 14 days. Luis, take UFOs and UAPs out of the conversation for a moment. Luis Elizondo, and it's not disputed, was the director of the office that communicated with the, the attorneys for the 9-11 mastermind, a trial that is still going on today. And he was communicating with them years ago, but that trial is still there today in the courts, still making headlines because it's not done yet. And they're just gonna let all that information go. The attorneys for KSM can never cite that as evidence anymore because there's no record of it. Let's just say, and this is a hypothetical, that the attorneys were communicating with Luis Elizondo about their access or whatever. That's not evidence the DOD would keep in the trial of the 9-11 mastermind. That's not historically relevant. Come on. I mean, that's, that's silly. But what this story really opens up is a much bigger issue than Luis Elizondo and UFOs. And I never knew that it would turn into this. And that story is essentially the fact or the reality that let's just say for a moment, the DOD is telling the truth that they are following another agency's retention schedule, which dictates in 14 days, all that email attachments, calendars, chat transcripts, they're all wiped out. If that is true, this story has opened up that the hundreds of pages of records, what are called records disposition schedules within the office of the secretary of defense are all sitting there, not being followed. They talk about how the attorneys and their information should be kept different types of employees, secretary of defense, deputy secretary of defense, capstone officials, non capstone officials. It breaks down everything. But according to the DOD, they follow none of it. If this is the truth. If they're following this agency over here, DISA, that means that their mound of disposition schedules, no one cares. Now, why is all that important? Well, I just went over one employee's previous employee's account in one situation from one department from one time frame, And it just happens to be the biggest trial ever post 9-11 of one of the terrorists. And yet all that information is gone. Now ask yourself, what else is being let go what else is being deleted or destroyed or not taken care of all because somebody didn't click a button because they didn't pay attention in their journaling class i mean all of that is utterly ridiculous but it opened up this possibility that they are not adhering to a very important aspect to records retention and it can tie into legal issues moral issues. Look at what they're doing to Luis Elizondo. If they are taking shots at him, now there may be no proof. If a lot of what he was doing through email and not written formal reports, right? So let's say all of that was true. And all of this was through email, or at least a majority of it. They just wiped all that out. So there are moral obligations here in situations very much like this, whether you believe him or not. And it makes no difference if you or I or anybody believes him or not. This is a prime example of why that information should be kept because it's evidence, not only in a trial like KSM, but also it could very much settle a dispute between the Pentagon saying, no, this person didn't do it or, or do what they said. And the other person saying, yes, I did. That is evidence to prove or disprove whichever side is telling the truth. Yet now we know all of that is gone. And in the process of actually pursuing this story, all of a sudden it opens up the reality 
that nobody is following these schedules over here in the entire Department of Defense? <laughs> Do you know how much information that is? That is an enormous amount of information. Luis Elizondo's data was at least eight or nine years that I can count for, and all of that is gone. How much more is missing? There's two things I'm a huge advocate for with, with the Black Vault, and that is preservation and transparency in that order. I do believe that some secrets should be kept, but I try my darndest to get a hold of them. But above all else, I believe those secrets should be preserved whether they be for a future generation, whether they be for whatever, there's a multitude of reasons, I believe that that should be kept. And yet here in the Department of Defense, and there's a lot of components within the DOD, if they truly are going to pass off that the records retention schedule for DISA trumps their own, that's silliness. I mean, downright silliness and does not make sense. So this has broken above and beyond Luis Elizondo and UFOs and UAPs. And even though a lot of those that are following this story are more interested in UFOs and UAPs than, than likely anything else that might be lost at this point, the implications behind what is being lost is staggering, truly staggering. And that's what I mean is that you have to look at how big this story potentially is with them trying to pass off this excuse. Then you do have the other end of the spectrum. They're lying. And if they're lying, then they're taking essentially a person like Luis Elizondo and just trying to cover him up. There's, there's really no middle ground. Did they just make a mistake with only Luis Elizondo's box? Probably not. So there's kind of no middle ground in my opinion. This is either a cover up of who he is or who he was, or this is a massive problem within the, the infrastructure of the DOD and records retention. I'm not sure which one I'm leaning towards right now, but I do have in writing all of their claims and everything that they're trying to pass off when it comes to this. And so that's what I have to go for when it comes to evidence and documents. And that's what I've gone back to the DOD complaining about. And until other evidence is put to light, then we'll see. But with that, it's a huge story. So you guys got some insight, a little bit of, of why I do what I do with this story, uh, with, the trans, uh, with the preservation and transparency. But this is a much bigger story, albeit much drier than fun UAPs and UFOs and classified documents and stuff like that. But the implications behind what, are, what is lost here is huge. And if you want to tie it into UFOs and UAPs, then again, let's just say Mr. Elizondo was dealing with a government contractor or another outside organization. Well, we can't FOIA them. So all of that information is now gone, at least on the side of the DOD. Somebody else wants to come out with it, great. But all of that is gone on the side of the DOD. Now, I have hinted at this. I think I said it the other day in one of the interviews that I did uh, outside of this channel, but I'll say it here and then we'll, we'll open up the lines. The email box, according to them, is managed by DISA. So their excuse is that DISA deletes it in 14 days. The technical part of this that I haven't really drove home, but I'll do it really quickly, is that they absolutely could be warranted to delete that email box within 14 days. But you have to separate an email box from the actual email content. So that email box, which is operated by DISA, yeah, 14 days, that makes sense, maybe. Sure, they delete it. However, the DOD side, the OSD, this material here, the content in the email box, those records, that data is supposed to be kept per their own schedule. So part of what they're saying may be true, but they're completely omitting the other part, and that's really kind of driving the point home uh, that this is, you know, utterly ridiculous and very much not true. Uh, but if let's say Luis Elizondo was communicating with a secretary of defense or a deputy secretary of defense or whomever that might be, what, what will hopefully survive are those email boxes. 
So prior to publishing this story and and the the revelation that his information was deleted, prior to publishing that, I filed numerous FOIA cases on all the people that I felt that Luis Elizondo communicated with and asked for all communications between Mr. Elizondo and that particular person. There's quite a few of them. Those cases are moving. I've got quite a few now updates. I've had to whittle it down. Uh, they're saying you're asking for 10 years worth of emails. That's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of emails. And so it, it's seem, seemingly working. So I am now focusing on each one of those individual cases with all the individual people figuring out how to whittle it down so they'll accept it. And then we can kind of move on from there. So that's, that's, that's the update on that case and something that I feel is, is very important and has turned into uh, essentially a much bigger issue than what we have, uh, you know, essentially been dealing with. So here's, I'm going to put the, the, the phone line. I could, I could think of it. I gonna put the phone line on screen. Also on there is a texting number, but this may be the last time that I have that on there. You guys have been so awesome and supportive of this show that the, the calls, uh, I couldn't even get to all of the calls, let alone the text messages. So if you want a chance to be heard, definitely call in. Uh, the way that it works is simply this. You call in. I may have to put you on hold. You might hear some music. Or, or if you are on hold, it'll tell you if you're second in line, third in line, fourth in line, and so on. And then I'll bring you on when I can. Make sure I'm turned down in the back. That is a huge help to me. Uh, but with that uh, being said, feel free to call in and then I will uh, bring you on. So with that, calls are already coming in. You are live on the air. Who's this? Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm from Connecticut. And uh, first of all, John, I, I just have to say thank you for all the work that you do. Um, and the email retention thing is absolutely nuts. The fact that they don't follow their own retention schedule. Even corporate offices have a retention schedule that they have to follow. So that's right. That's kind of mind blowing. Um, my question for you is, so just in general, you have years of experience with FOIA and uh, obviously some experience with this mandatory declassification process as well that you've been talking about. Do you have any tips or advice or, or things for people that want to start looking into doing this type of stuff as well um, in terms of, because I know I tried it once mm -hmm. with uh, kind of a lesser quote unquote UFO or UAP thing uh, about the bet sphere. And all I got was you contacted the wrong group or you contacted, and you got to go to this group. We go to that group. We have no records. Uh, you know, okay, well maybe try this other group. And um, I'm just trying to figure out, uh, you know, what resources are out there? What recommendations do you have in terms of finding the right group and the right way to structure these requests? Great question. So first, thank you for the kind words. Truly appreciate that. When it comes to finding the right place, that is always a challenge. I've done this for 25 years. A lot of times I don't go to the right place or I file it in the wrong way or what, whatever it might be. So what you try and do is essentially just keep trying, don't give up. And if you're not sure, let's say you got it round down to three different agencies, file to all of them. Like it, the worst that can happen is they kick it back and they say, we're sorry, we have no records pertaining to your request. Or if they're an agent uh, agency that likes to help, and there are a lot of those out there, they're not all bad. Uh, if, if they want to help, they will forward it to, uh, for you. And so essentially that's, that's the, uh, I use this term a lot, the OCA or the original classifying authority. That's essentially who you need to find to file the FOIA request too. But a lot of times you can't, can't figure it out, you know, and, and that's, that's the challenge. And so if you have a, a short list of agencies file everywhere and see where you end up, because the worst that can happen is that they kick it back and they say, no, sorry, you need to go to OSD or no, sorry you need to go to FBI, but we forwarded it for you. And that makes it helpful. So uh, I, I, I'm hoping that addresses your question, but I think it's my biggest advice above all else is don't give up or get discouraged because that is very common. It's common with me and it's common with people that uh, are, are just starting out and those that have been doing it for decades. 
you just sometimes hit the wrong agency and they just kick it back and they go, sorry, we got nothing. So I would, I would keep trying and I would, um, you know, when in doubt file everywhere and all of the above. All right. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I'll just say, uh, from my personal perspective, um, I'm very glad that I found you and the black vault because honestly, there are so many people that put so much spin on everything and try to make it like they found something amazing or outstanding or whatever in order to try to get into the media cycle. And what I like about you is you approach things very objectively, very open-mindedly, and you don't jump to conclusions or try to get hype off of it. So um, you're definitely one of my most trusted sources when it comes to all of this stuff regarding UAP, regarding uh, government stuff. Uh, so thank you again for all the work that you do. Well, I really appreciate that. And thank you. Yeah. Whenever you have a question, either feel free to email me or call in on one of these shows. I'm, I'm definitely happy to help, but thank, thank you for that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to do my best. Like I said, with the chat room, I see some texts coming in. My guess is, uh, there's going to be a phone call right behind this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pull up a couple text messages here as we're waiting for another phone call. First one, is it possible to FOIA the department communications about your FOIA requests, i.e. they tell you that Lou never had assigned responsibilities at ATIP? Could you find out how they came to that conclusion? Uh, the answer is yes. Here is the FOIA conundrum when doing that and sifting through the conversations about a publicly released statement. And essentially what you run into is exemption B5 under the Freedom of Information Act. What that is, is in uh, the nutshell explanation is internal deliberations. And essentially when they're talking about something and they're talking about a, um, when they're talking about something and they're trying to like either make a report or make a statement or something to that effect, that is going to be the internal deliberation. So they will exempt all of that up until the final report or the final comment. And, and that's going to be the, you know, the, um, the only thing they release. So in this particular instance, yes, you can, and you go after, you know, how did you come up with that decision? But more, more times than not, they will black out all of that and then only give you the part that was the approved language to go out to the general public, and then they will essentially be five exempt everything else. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm not trying. And yes, I do have open cases for that. And yes, I do have some hope that I will get something, but all of those cases are primarily open. I even tracked down some of the legal people that they likely coordinated with. I've had those requests open as well. So I think that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, find out where we end up. Um, I am realizing as I'm talking here that I think I have a technical issue with my phone. Uh, now, for whatever reason, I believe that those who came in behind that first caller, they are not coming through. Uh, I know that because that has actually been a technical issue. And I forgot that it may translate to this live call in show. If you are on hold, let me know uh, in the chat. And I can see that and I'll pull up a text message. If you are, you may have to hang up and call back. And I apologize. The way you find out is if you're being told that you're first in line or second in line, whatever it may be, tell me in the chat. I feel really bad that that I'm just realizing that as we're live and I'm going to be very angry with my telephone provider. But um, that said, what I can do is just have you guys hang up, call back and hopefully we can clear out the queuing system. But I may actually have to end it uh, or at least deal with text messages here. So I do apologize and, and messages in the chat room. Uh, here's another one. Lou, um, Luis and others on the forbidden online event last Saturday gave you huge props while on panel with Jimmy church, Dolan Pope and Mol Linda Moulton. Howe. I did hear about that and, and I'm very appreciative of it. I haven't seen it. Uh, I am going to be getting the video. So hopefully we can, you know, explore that a little bit more. I did hear he was very complimentary to me. And so for that, I'm, I'm very, very thankful. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to read here as we go. 
What are your thoughts on Lieutenant Colonel Hector Quintanilla and his work with the Foreign Technology Division in the 1960s? Do you find his frustrations familiar? And how much do you see history repeating itself in your line of work? Thank you. Keep up the awesome work. So great question. So Hector Quintanilla, who was the head of Project Blue Book towards the end uh, for quite a few years, he's one of the you know famous kind of grumpy looking guys with a staff of like five people sitting around him. He's the guy in the desk. That's the most famous. Uh, yes, I, I, I know who that is. Yes. I believe that there's more to the story. How much more? I'm not sure. I believe that during that era, people like Hector Quintanilla were tasked to essentially, uh, stop everything, you know, don't, don't investigate it, explain it. And in the Project Blue Book documents that were found in the attic, you know, like the the garage by by investigator Rob Mercer. I've talked about that a couple times on this channel. Amazing stuff that was tied to uh, one of the former Project Blue Book people. The I think what was exposed, the evidence shows what was exposed with that was that they didn't care about investigating. And all of that was spearheaded by Hector Quintanilla towards the end. And what was also revealed was that Dr. J. Allen Hynek wrote letters specifically to Hector Quintanilla saying, I do not agree with this past conclusion. I feel that we need to uh, essentially reopen this case. And Quintanilla was like, no, leave it alone. He was upset that Dr. J. Allen Hynek was making these appearances and, and, and so on of, um, not not saying that he was speaking on behalf of the Air Force, but but essentially that's how Hector Quintanilla took it. And he says, you've been a consultant. You are not to speak on our behalf and uh, was was clearly angry at at uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek. So that was uh, a very telling, I would say, very telling piece of evidence in the form of quite a few different letters and documentation. So uh do I find his frustrations familiar? I'm not entirely sure what you mean by frustrations uh, in that regard. Maybe you're referencing somebody else, but hopefully that gave you a little bit of backstory of who he was, because I truly don't believe he was tasked to figure out the UFO phenomena. I believe going back to the Robertson panel in 1952 and 53 with the CIA, they essentially mandated you guys solve this, but it doesn't matter you know, how you do it. Just calm the public down. They were more concerned about the general public. So I think that that's, um, that's, that's what I would say about Hector Quintanilla. John, first off, impeccable work. As always, I was curious to know what agency or agencies are usually the least cooperative as far as, far as FOIA requests go. Thank you. Uh, and I am sorry about the phone line. I'm, I'm increasingly frustrated here because I know that it's um, not working. So I do apologize uh, for those who are on the air. So... That said, if you are listening to this and you're waiting on hold, uh, please uh, hang up because it's not going to come through. It's just that first call. So when I get off from this, I'll be calling my provider. With your uh, question, the least cooperative as far as FOIA requests go, uh, th it's very hard to, to, to kind of say, well, these people are really difficult. Uh, simply because sometimes you get different FOIA officers, some of which are more helpful than others. So I hate to brand an agency. I will say, though, overall, the most problematic for me, I would say, is the IRS. Uh, their FOIA team, at least I, I would say about a year and a half, two years ago, was, was not fun to deal with on various requests, not UFO related, but just uh, the, the FOIA office there was not fun. The CIA has been very challenging over the years on many, many different issues and requests. That particular one would be about UFOs as well. Uh, the mind control saga that took me years to get documents, uh, even acknowledged that they didn't release them or give them to me, uh, was ridiculous. It should not have happened. And yet the CIA put up this ridiculous fight. So you have those that are, that really are bad to deal with on the opposite end, the FOIA team at OSD, the department of defense. Uh, I have there's quite a few different people that I deal with. Uh, one in particular, I don't want to spotlight him uh, b by name, but one in particular has, has been very, very helpful in the past. And and uh, that is truly appreciated when that happens. There are other agencies as well uh, that that over time, you know, you realize that they want to help more than hinder. And, and that's always a nice thing to see. Um, 
to flip back to the bad side, the one other that I uh, just remember would be the DIA or the Defense Intelligence Agency. The the DIA it has such a backlog in, um, I would say such a backlog in cases that it doesn't matter how good their team is, they take years to process requests now. And it is so frustrating. I just got one a couple months ago, which I think was from 2014. So it's like, it's, it's utterly ridiculous when it gets to that big of a case log that something needs to budge and change, you know? And I think that that's, uh, that's something that you, you should, sorry if that's coming through the audio there. I'm trying to fix the phone line as I go, but I don't think it's going to happen. Forgive that sound tone one more time. Yeah, I don't think it's going to happen. So uh, with with that, the DIA is just just horrible. So hopefully that gives you a couple lists. But I, I wouldn't say that there's any one agency that that really shines over others or is really bad. It just it depends on the time frame, the topic and essentially who you're dealing with. Here's another one. How likely is it the page counts were leaked with different counts to help determine who is leaking? That's an excellent question. And whomever asked that, uh, there's no name. Whoever asked that, uh, my guess is you might have some either corporate espionage background, uh, but in an investigatory way, or potentially, you know, maybe CI counterintelligence. Uh, but that is a absolute tactic possibility. Uh, absolutely. Uh, in I, I won't expand. Uh, that's a possibility. Do I believe that that's the case? Maybe. I would again imagine that Mr. Elizondo does have the have contacts. So if if any if there's any truth to any of those rumors, I believe it would be with him. And the thing that makes sense would be that draft report. Uh, and at least with him, you know, he's not touting that he has some secret source. I mean, he he kind of alludes to, in my opinion, anyway, kind of alludes to the fact that he's involved with the effort. Now, despite what the Pentagon says to counter that, that could very well be true. So what I haven't figured out yet is was there a difference between the effort of the UAPTF, which is within the U.S. Navy, and could Mr. Elizondo have played a role in that aspect? They took that draft, sent it over to ODNI for final approval. They created a dumbed-down, trimmed version of it. That's perfectly plausible. Uh, from what I understand, um, but I still need to see the video, it sounds like there is still a push that the 70 plus pages went to the Senate. And if that's the case, that's why I stress, give me the evidence. So if he still maintains that meaning Mr. Elizondo, and I haven't chatted with him yet uh, about this, we, we, as I mentioned, had spoken earlier last week, and uh, there was a situation where he couldn't contribute to those two articles, which was fine. So I know that we'll continue to, uh, to touch base. I just haven't, you know, talked to him since the weekend to see if, if he's still maintaining those 70 plus pages went to the Senate or the version at one point was 70 plus pages. So we'll, we'll see on that. Do you think that extraterrestrials could be an explanation for some UAP UFO cases? Uh, am I 100% convinced? No. Do I think that's a big possibility? Absolutely. Uh, plain and simple. I think that there's too much advancement in technology over the decades that's documented with radar visual sightings, those that have been seen with the human eye, with um, evidence to, to, to back it up. I think that possibility is not ruled out. I, I've, I've tried. I've tried to say that this is ridiculous and, and the notion of it is, is um, implausible, but it's, it's not. In fact, it's very plausible. Um, uh, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to anyway. There's a book behind me that I wrote called Inside the Black Vault. And in the last chapter, this is what I do and deal with specifically is my trek to debunk the debunkers or to essentially confirm them. And essentially it came out to debunking the debunkers that what they say and what they claim to dismiss that theory and that hypothesis is essentially um, not possible. Meaning what they, what angle they choose and where they are trying to, um, I would say, explain away all this stuff, they can't. The evidence itself, the documentation, that is too overwhelming to do that. 
And I broke down instances in the book, and I've done it on this channel, where technology is far beyond that's documented in these cases, far beyond where humanity is. And in a lot of them through the 40s and 50s, by now, when 70 plus years has passed, we likely would have learned about the technology, whether it be a classified piece or private sector, if they if they develop something that would account for some of these documented sightings, and they don't have it. And so the question mark is, why not? You know, did they did they have something and after all this time still not declassify it? Or at this point? Can we kind of conclude that they didn't have it? And so that's why I keep that that hypothesis on the table to kind of see, okay, that fixed it. All right, it may be not get fixed, but if you guys are on the phone, I'm gonna be able to start taking calls here. So I'm sorry I was getting a little sidetracked, but I wanted to see if a last ditch effort that would work. So so it did. So I found a way to hopefully maybe get some some calls here. But to finalize that thought, I have not taken it off the table. The documentation and the evidence that people can get through the Freedom of Information Act is too overwhelming. And in that chapter of the book, I don't use leaked information. I don't use third hand information. I don't use private sector sightings, meaning something outside the military. All I deal with is what the US military and government has given me. And that's why I keep the hypothesis on the table. Uh, and this caller, I'm so sorry, because I'm sure you were on hold for maybe a long time. I finally kind of fixed my phone system. So I apologize. Uh, who is this? This is Steve. Hi, Steve. And uh, I don't know how long you were on hold, but I apologize. Uh, thank you for calling. What can I do for you? You still there, Steve? Yeah, Steve hung up. After all that time, Steve, uh, I'm going to see how I could potentially... And this is the joy of a live show. I hope I don't have to keep keep doing this, but I may have to. So bear with me here really quick. I may just have to keep shutting down my software and bringing it back up. So we'll see. Uh, joys of a live show, everybody. So I do apologize. Uh, so we'll see what happens. Yep, that's going to work. So it may just take me a couple seconds in between calls. All right, you're live on the air. Who's this? Hey, this is John. It is. Hi. Who's this? Hey, John. Hey, John. This is Sneaky Toaster. Um, I was actually on. Uh, I was just. I asked you a question the other day. Yes. Uh, I remember. I remember your nickname. What was the question? Remind yeah, me. I'm you. sorry. I did a couple hey, interviews, um, but I remember your nickname. Yeah. So, so I really appreciate what you're doing with the Black Vault. You know, definitely getting all those FOIAs out for people to consume and understand. I just had a quick question for you. Sure. Um, and I was going to ask you the other day. Um, Luis Elizondo in an interview, I forget who exactly it was with, um, you're right, he's doing a lot of interviews, of course, these days. Um, but specifically, he was asked the question concerning um, if craft may have been recovered via archaeological digs or, um, right, something of that nature. Um, and I just took note of that, and I think others did too, because it, you know, whether or not Lazar's story is credible. Mm hmm it does echo what Lazard did state on a Joe, on the Joe Rogan uh, episode that he appeared on, right, with Jeremy Corbell. And it was specifically referring to um, there was potentially something recovered as part of an archaeological dig. Now, my question to you was just, you know, not necessarily dealing with Lazard specifically, right, but dealing more with have you ever tried to FOIA anything in regards to archaeological digs and or, you know, UAP, UFO, uh, ET, something of that nature, right? Um, again, that you know, it, it does. It is interesting because the UAP task force, you know, they went from 2004 to current versus going back in time further because we know that there's, uh, you know, there's quite the amount of data that has created a paper trail. Um, so I thought I would just ask you the question, um, and you know, I didn't want to dialogue too much with you because maybe other callers coming in, um, but I just I saw a pattern. Um, and I know that you look for patterns whenever you're looking for, you know, the breadcrumbs within the FOIA documents. And I just wanted to know if you had ever researched any of this. So I would say when it comes to the the archaeological dig stuff, 
specifically not when it comes to UFOs. I did hear that he had said something uh, in in you know one of the one of the interviews he did. I didn't quite hear it, so I, I don't know what he was referencing. To sure. blank to blanket like so, I'm trying to find the right way to say this. To blanket request like give me everything about archaeological digs pertaining to X Y Z. You really need to be more specific, and I can I can sure. just tell you right off the bat that they would kick it back. In the interview, let me ask you: in the interview, were there any specifics whatsoever? So he gave an example, um, and someone in chat might be able to help navigate. Again, this was uh, it was a very very good, um, I think, an hour and a half long, um, you know, stream interview with him. The other, um, so, so he gave the example when when kind of pushed on the topic. Um, he gave the example of you're going on an archaeological dig, say the pyramids, right, or ancient Egypt. I, I don't know if he specifically said Egypt, so I don't want to put words in, uh, you know, Mr. Elizondo's mouth. But I know that he was referring to it as a as almost an, uh, um, giving a, an example, I guess a metaphor. You know, he said that you would find, um, you know, among all of the different relics and artifacts, a fully intact 747. Now, that given the time period for something that from you know you're going on an archaeological dig that doesn't belong there right um at least to, to us right to, to our understanding it doesn't make sense why something like that would be among something uh, of any of the ancient world um i do know too and i'm not trying to switch gears too much but i do know that the question was also asked specifically about language and as far as this, is there kind of a language that may or may not exist that we don't fully understand yet, but based on maybe runes, symbols, any type of, you know, hieroglyphics or anything like that, that is, um, again, maybe being studied and just, you know, by, say, the Invisible College or, right? And again, I'm, I'm sure you maybe have heard of the Invisible College and, maybe that's another path for you to go down, right? The Jacques Ballet tie in with the invisible college specifically, but then there would be private industry and private more so than say government. Yeah. Um, so I just, I don't know. I thought I would just ask these questions. Um, you've been very helpful. Again, I know you kind of got to be pinpoint accurate uh, and kind of hit the right chord, if you will, when it comes to un, uh, unarchiving something that might've been kind of locked away somewhere. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. That, that's okay. So you have a couple parts to your question. Uh, the the first part again uh, with the archaeological stuff. I mean, really, you would need to in order to to drill down with official documentation and so on and so forth. You would just need specifics, you know, and that that would be the hindrance on that. So if there's ever right. even a time frame, an agency, uh, but but kind of a broad stroke request or even if if there was a hint at the pyramids what agency would that be i mean you really have to put up sure. a, a pretty a pretty good case so to speak yeah to convince let's say no the no DIA. i get it i just thought i would ask if if you had ever done anything you know research and into anything of that or found any breadcrumbs with archaeological reference the only other question i had really quick was um you know there's been a lot of talk um i believe kevin is it chill child children children's he was former IG, right? He's been he's been uh, Chil Childers, Ch I think Chil is his Childress, last name. Kevin Childress. Yes. Um, he yeah, he doesn't like he doesn't like me too much. <laughs> he thinks I he thinks I'm um, working for the government. By the way. Oh, oh, does he? Yes. Oh, well, he doesn't like you. I'm sorry. No, no, but, that's okay. But, if you have a question, no, I'm no, happy no. to try to address. No, my my question is specifically involving um, his direction to suggest the Department of Energy, right? And I'm sure you've gotten some some. Uh, and people may be asking the same question yeah. uh, as far as what may or may not be able to be obtained from Department of Energy and or the labs. Um, so, again, you know, apart from, you know, Kevin's, you know, response or, or belief, you know, for what you are aren't involved in. Right. It's just uh, I, I thought I would ask about the Department of Energy. Sure. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. And, and I didn't mean to make a joke about it. Yeah, that, I know who you're talking about because I remember he advertises himself as a special agent and. You know, he was attacking me online, saying I was giving disinformation, stuff like that. But I'm glad you asked the question because it is a good one. With the Department of Ener Energy, there's a lot of speculation about the secrecy behind the DOE, DOE and how much can you hide, 
you know, within the layers of the DOD and, and so on. When it comes to, to you know, UFO information, um, I, I would have to look back. I remember that years ago I got a no records response with them. Could could they be hiding stuff? Of course, but so so could every other. Look at everyone. Yeah, sure. I mean, so could every other yep. agency. So I think that when it comes to secrecy and hiding behind classification, of course the DOE could do it. But I think that when it comes to to secrecy, uh, any agency can do that. So I mean, if if look if if the DOD, the Pentagon, the White House, the President whomever is spearheading a cover up of of whatever kind any and every agency has the capability to cover it up and keep it hidden some admittedly more so than others but i think they're all very well capable and so hey, I, so I i don't really hop. hey john i'm gonna let you go just yeah so you no, can get no to other, other people's questions no I, I appreciate Thanks. that I'll, I'll finish the thought but yeah thank you so yeah to, to, to finalize that thought i mean essentially it's every agency has that ability to do it and so whether or not the they're going to pick one particular agency to hide behind i just personally don't see that uh one thing here as i reset the phone software do you uh black dread scotland i really appreciate your support of the channel uh, i put that on screen so i didn't forget do you think the ufo phenomenon is a uh, psychological operation to cover up u.s air force assets that is one of the best questions in my mind when it comes to some of these uh, encounters that the Navy is having. And it brings up a very important issue that I think some people don't realize. It's okay to question this. It's okay to question that can, can the best of the best pilots, and those men and women up there are the best of the best, but they are trained on their aircraft with specific you know, angles. They are not read into all of the other potential technology that's out there. And so the question arises, could the United States Air Force be testing something of a classified, highly classified nature during a Navy exercise? And on paper, I mean, I've thought I'm not trying to debunk anything here. I don't know. But it makes sense that the Navy, if they were kept in the dark, or, or very few people were read in about a test, the Navy's official stance would be, we have no idea what these things are. They're unidentified aerial phenomena. And in the eyes of the United States Air Force, keep in mind that military branch that has been completely silent about this entire issue until the UAP issue, uh, until the UAP report was issued. Uh, you know, look at that. I mean, I find that really interesting. Could that encompass those extra pages in the, in the classified portion? Does the Air Force play a role in that? I'm not sure, but it goes to the heart of this question. So in the eyes of the Navy, they're UAP. In the eyes of the Air Force that's been mum, they know exactly what it is, but essentially it's classified, so they're just keeping their mouth shut about it. Senate gets involved, they start pushing for answers, and they say, hey, wait a minute, You know, we want to know what the heck is going on. Uh, what is it? And so now in a classified setting, the Air Force, which again, happens to be the one that co-authored the report or drafted the report with the UAP task force has a say. So that agency who's been quiet all of a sudden has the biggest say when the Senate starts asking questions. So I think that that should be read into. Am I going to bank money on that and bet my house? Uh, no, I'm not going to bet my house on it. But I think it's very, very, very much a question that's not answered yet. And, uh, and it should be noted, I did bring that scenario that possibility to the pentagon saying could the u.s air force do this and they said no now whether or not that is true i'll let you guys decide uh but i did bring that that po potential about a year and a half two years ago to the pentagon seeking comment on whether or not the air force would test classified technology against another branch of the u.s military potentially without their knowledge and they said no so take that for what it's worth. But great question. Thank you, Black Dread Scotland. Truly appreciate the support of the channel and for that question. Let me go ahead and go back to the phones. Uh, sorry for the for the long wait. I have no idea how long you were holding, but who's this? Hi, John. Uh, this is Brandon. Hey there. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for taking my call. My, my pleasure. What can I do for you? Well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for everything that you've been doing for the you know the community trying to get disclosure out 
Um, I know it can't be easy. And uh, I, I had a few things I wanted to run by you. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm sure you're probably aware by now of uh, Ross Coltart. Yes. The Australian journalist. Yes. Uh, I know you don't do a ton of interviews or anything, but I was wondering if you were planning on maybe having him uh, do a, like some sort of an interview with him. Uh, yes. Uh, interesting. You should say that. Uh, I have talked to Ross. Yes. We're trying to set something up. You're right. I don't do a ton of interviews, uh, just sadly because of schedule reasons, uh, and daddy yeah. duty and stuff like that. I've got two kids, uh, but I, I definitely aim to do more of them. And I have spoken to Ross cause I definitely want to bring him onto the show. We spoke last week. He was, uh, doing an interview and I think an event this last weekend, but I know definitely a, a big show of his own. So, uh, we're hopefully going to set something yeah. up in the next week or two. Yeah, because I, I mean, I'm 34. I've been obsessed with this phenomenon for the majority of my life, mm -hmm. at least since I was about 14 or so. I've watched every documentary. I've, I know just about everything there is about the subject. Um, seen tons of interviews, and it really was his recent interview on Project Unity and his other interview on Fade to Black that just really made me. Just seeing someone who's very credible and that thought the whole thing was BS, you know, and then hearing his, uh, he seems to have made some very uh, interesting contacts, and he's kind of made the jump that a lot of us have made, where it's like, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, and that's the argument I've always made towards my friends who kind of think it's BS, and I'm like, there's no way that the government or the military cracked anti-gravity text in the 40s. Yeah. And then even if they did, they still, they like, we would see this technology by now in some way. And and then they're, they're flying technology over houses and, you know, black, big black triangle crafts hovering over houses and stuff. It just makes no sense. It's yeah. Just, you know, you connect the dots. After a while, it's just kind of like, okay, well, there's only one one other possibility that what it could be. Yeah. You know, and uh, and my other thing I wanted to bring to you is the perspective. Uh, <clears throat> maybe some of the listeners saw this post on Reddit um, yesterday. I put I I brought up uh, a perspective that kind of dawned on me over the weekend. Um, so everyone knows about, uh, Jesse Marcel, right? The, uh, the lieutenant that was like the first, uh, official. Right. At the scene of Roswell. That, yeah. At the scene of the Roswell crash. Okay. Now just going off of, um, his military background, he was a career military man. And if we compare him to commander Fravor. Okay. I mean, just do you see where I'm going here? Like, not uh, just by their staff. I mean, what? So the military came out and was like, "It's a weather balloon, this, that, and the other." And he insisted that no, it was a crash. Oh, I, I see. Which is going going against he, going against the company line. Yeah, and even back then, I, what I'm saying is credibility here. Right. I mean, the man. The man was a mil. I mean, it, he was uh, what second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Air Force. Yeah, he uh, he was in Air uh, Air Force Intelligence School. He was uh, the fifth bomber command of the Southwest Pacific. He, I mean, the dude had some serious credentials. Yeah, and all I, the way I, up until he died. I think I know. I, yeah, not to not to step on you. I I think I know where you're going with that. And and yeah, I think we need more people. Yeah, I, now I could see the comparison with somebody like Fravor and and Commander and, and Dietrich and stuff Fravor like that. Also, has a lot of high credentials, and I'm just I'm, I'm I understand that there's more evidence for Fravor's encounter, but I'm saying if we take away the video evidence and everything, and we just go by very two two separate credible uh, military individuals. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I, what I'm saying is, is if we if we trust in Fravor's uh, uh, account, sure, then I feel like we kind of have to look at Jesse Marcel's account as well, maybe as being a little more credible. I got gotcha. you. Well, 
Um, I, let me let me let me respond to that. I'm not going to try and hang up on you. I got to reset my my software here, but but uh, let me respond to it off the air. But I appreciate the call. No problem. Thank you. So yeah, I mean it's it's a point when there's credibility, but I think you can't really compare the two. Uh, and the reason is is that really when you come to military witnesses, come to military cases, so on and so forth, you have to drill down on each one individually. And even though there's credibility, you still need to look at the evidence involved. You need to look at uh, essentially everything that is there to digest for that particular case. So I think that if if you say you believe Fravor, then you have to believe Marcel. I would respectfully disagree and say, no, you, you, you don't have to go down that line. You just have to look at each individual one, see if there's enough evidence. Do you like what they say, what they're showing, how they're proving their case and go from there. Pib star. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. I really, really appreciate that. I know it took me a couple minutes to, uh, thank you for that, but, uh, but, but definitely thank you for the uh, donation through YouTube. Everything uh, everything that comes through the super chat goes right back into the channel. So it's a way to show your support and, and helps fund the cases and documents and stuff like that, because sometimes it's not always cheap to, 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 to do it. So thank you guys for showing your support. Let me go ahead and go to the phones. You're live on the air. Who's this? Hello, John. This is Dave from New Jersey. How are you? Hey, Dave. I'm good. Good. Thank you. How are you? Doing, uh, doing well. Um, escape death another time since we last talked. I had a stroke in January, but only affected some of my speech. But oh, um, I'm doing. Sorry good. to hear that. Well, you sound great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm doing doing well. Uh, they can't they can't kill me. Uh, <laughs> I'm really glad to see a live show from you. I'm not sure if you've been doing it. I haven't been online as much lately, but I come. I was. Remembering something I wanted to ask you about from a couple of years ago. Do you remember that one a crazy thing happened? Some observatory was sh shut down and the FBI swooped into this whole little town and they made all the people leave and even the people in the post office. And for like a week, there was no information coming out whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember that the the solar observatory that was shut down. I actually have open yes. requests for that. Uh, I believe I don't want to misspeak. I believe there was an investigation where they claimed that there was, if I remember correctly, inappropriate material on one of the computers on the inside. Um, but exactly. I, I, yeah, that the was, I think the, the yeah. story, but I still have open requests on that to see, you know, what evidence will actually come out, if any. Right, because I was like, exactly, it was like a week or 10 days later, they came out with saying some guy in the observatory had porn or, yeah. you know, something to that effect on the computer. But, like, you wouldn't have, like, military helicopters, like, shut down a, a major observatory. It made no sense whatsoever, yeah. you know, and that was... I just... Like, yeah. Sooner or later, I I know you'll find out the truth for that. Hopefully, we'll we'll. And thanks for reminding me. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, kind of check back, but I believe I have a request with the FBI, if memory serves. This was the I had to look it up to refresh my memory, but the Sunspot Solar Observatory uh, in New Mexico. So yeah, so they they said one thing, whether or not it's true or not, I'm not really sure, but we'll see what kind of uh, what kind of evidence comes in, but. I really, uh, really appreciate your call, Dave. You sound good, so I'm, I'm sorry for the health issues, but you know, definitely, uh, definitely call in again. Hey, no, one last question. Sure. Are you going to be on the East Coast anytime in 2021? On the East Coast, you said? Yeah. Uh, not planning on it anyway. Um, in Los Angeles, COVID is starting to get bad again, so. They yeah, just uh, started putting mask restrictions again and this and that. So I was looking forward to starting to travel again. But with uh, two two kids and stuff, uh, it, it makes right. it really challenging. And then we'll see what the next couple months bring with the fall and COVID and stuff like that. Because I, I just want to kind of be a little safe with my little ones. No, know, I living totally with my hear little you. Ones, but, uh, well, it was great to talk with you, John. Yeah. And I definitely look forward to um, talking to you again. And please stay safe. I, uh, I I definitely will, and thank you as well. Thanks for the call. So I'm putting something on screen here. Let me reset the software. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say this in the beginning. 
Let me see here. Sorry, I've lost the window. If you're a fan, Rusty Pack, thank you for, for bringing this up. If you're a fan of Unidentified Celebrity Review, please send positive vibes and prayers for Luis's fiance. She was in a bad accident today. That was posted on Twitter. I know he had a live stream. I actually thought he was on at one o'clock. Uh, I didn't realize he had multiple ones. And so I had scheduled this for four, uh, hoping that I wouldn't step on his show. Uh, then I realized I did. And then no sooner did I realize I did that, uh, read his tweet about his fiance. So I do hope that he and, uh, and obviously her are doing okay. Uh, I know that he was on the way to the hospital since I've been on the air here for uh, an hour and 42 minutes or so. I haven't seen Twitter. I don't know if he's posted updates. By all means, guys, if you see stuff in the ch in the uh, uh, Twitterverse or if he's doing updates, please update the chat room. I know a lot of people that watch his channel may have stumbled on this stream as well. So uh, so welcome to all of you. I'm sorry that that they're under these circumstances that he um, delayed his his show today. So my best wishes to him and his fiance. So thank you, Rusty, also for the, the support of the channel, uh, but also bringing that up to us as well. <laughs> thank you, Matthew Riot. Thanks for having watermelon sized cojones and doing the work. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, you are very, very welcome. And of course, thank you very much for that support and the kind words. I appreciate it. All right, let me hit the phones again. You're live. Who's this? Uh oh. Did I lose you? Dead air? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm there here. You I had yeah. you on hold. No worries. Who's this? This is Andrew. Hi, Andrew. What can I do for you? So I just had a two-part question, but I'll be quick about it. Um, first, we know that through, I believe it was Project Stargate, the U.S. Army had uh, done some work involving remote viewing or at least looking into that. Yes. So I was curious if you've ever done any FOIA requests involving that and received anything back. And then the second part was um, just about UAPs. Have you ever seen anything or heard anything that uh goes into the psychological aspect of it i've heard lou elizondo mention that there may be a, a psychological aspect to some of it yeah let me deal with the latter question first so the psychological aspect in what way well he wasn't very specific about it but i believe that someone maybe had mentioned remote viewing whenever he sort of started talking about that yeah. And then the other thing they had kind of talked about, not necessarily summoning, but um, he had referenced maybe using different psychological methods to potentially attract yeah. UAPs. I got gotcha. you. So, uh, so I can kind of see where your questions are connected. So the first part of it, the Stargate collection, yes, uh, my connection to that is more than 20 years ago when a lot of the documents were really starting to come out from the CIA, I had gotten their entire collection. They call it the Stargate collection. I bring up the CIA, but yes, it is true that other agencies played a role as well, which included the DIA with, um, with uh, projects they were doing, the U.S. Army. Uh, they all kind of funded different angles, but it ultimately ended up at the CIA under the Stargate collection, and they did all sorts of of crazy stuff. Obviously, Dr. Hal Putoff was heavily involved in that uh, through SRI or the Stanford Research in Institute. And what's interesting is for those who know the names about all of this, you'll know that he was a contractor on the present day uh, rumored UFO Pentagon UFO study that we all hear about known as ATIP and that he was a contractor on that. So he's been very much involved in this stuff for decades. And so uh, back to your question. Yeah. So what I did with that Stargate collection is I dumped it all online. So it is all available to you. There are literally thousands upon thousands of pages of documents uh, that you can download in an instant and uh, start reading to your heart's content. I think I saw somebody here. I lost yeah. the chat because it's already s kind of passed through. But uh, the 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 um, uh, gateway project, I think it was, or the gateway process, that was one that's gotten you know t a ton of publicity just simply because there's some crazy stuff involved. So within those records, I think it plays a role then in your second, uh, the second part of your question with the psychological aspect. Is there truth to it? That's the question. And what I feel listening to to Mr. Luis Elizondo 
is that I feel that whether it's true or not, again, my opinion is irrelevant. I believe that Dr. Hal Putoff's research has definitely influenced Luis Elizondo. And I feel that, and this is just an opinion, not based on anything. So please, uh, for those, not, not my caller here, but for anybody watching, please, I'm not trying to say anything bad here, but rather an observation that I think he's been heavily influenced by that because you can definitely draw some parallels between what he has said and the, the multitude of radio interviews he's done in the last you know few months and what you see hinted at or explored in the Stargate collection documents and and seeing that psychological aspect. I haven't really seen or heard Luis Elizondo go down the road of like a summoning angle where you could essentially channel them. He may have, I don't know. Uh, so I don't want to say he said that, but I know that that has definitely been brought up a lot, you know, throughout the years with, with UFOs and so on. So um, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I think what you might want to do is just go to the blackvault.com and search Stargate collection, and that'll come up with everything the CIA has. Literally, that they, okay. they claim it's wow. everything. So, so you can download it all. I think I have a zip file that you can download 100% of it, dump it to your hard drive, and you'll, you can read for the next year. Oh, all right, well, I'll definitely do that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep, you're very welcome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for the call. Thank you. All right. So let me uh, switch that. D Voss uh, in the YouTube channel. Thank you so much for your support. Do you trust Mellon? He's saying it's not ours. They break physics, which is in quotes. So I assume he said that, which I know he said something like that. They break physics. Where is the physical evidence of this? We only see slow moving dots via links. Now, Here's um, me trusting uh, uh, people. I, I'll, I'll say this out of respect to everybody out there. It's not that I don't trust people or I trust them, but rather I challenge them. Uh, I ask questions. All I demand, and some people hate me for this, is evidence for those that are making a claim. So that's my broad way of answering your question. So when it comes to me trusting uh, Christopher Mellon, it, it's for me, it's not about that. And I'm not trying to dodge your question. That really is how I operate. Anybody who watches this channel knows it doesn't matter who it is. I'll ask a question back, you know, and, and it's about it's a matter of can you back it up with evidence or is this an opinion or a claim based on none? And so that's how I approach it with Mr. Mellon. Here's what I will say in the positive. I know that that he definitely influenced the language that went into that that uh, you know the big COVID relief bill, which paved the way for this UAP, UAP report. I believe that he played and was instrument played a role and was instrumental in that. The language that he put into a post that he did quite some time ago, the unique language that he used and agencies that he named, like the FBI, which to me was a little bit bizarre. Um, but but may be very interesting, uh, but regardless, was translated into that language. And I think that that really shows who he was and, and essentially what he was saying when he was playing a role in that, that, that all that was true. So that's what I mean by evidence. If he makes a claim that he played a role in that, the evidence shows that he absolutely did. When he says that they're not ours, here's my respectful disagreement with that. Not that I don't believe it's not a possibility, but you can't discount it based on the report or you can't confirm it based on the report. And here's why, based on what Mr. Mellon has also said. He has also said that the United States Air Force has hindered the investigation, that they've essentially blocked access to the UAPTF. And he called out the U.S. Air Force specifically. If that is true, from a scientific standpoint, you can't rule out classified technology. I'm not saying it is, but you can't rule it out until you have the proper access and evidence to rule it out. So if Mr. Mellon is saying, and I believe he is likely correct, and I believe he would have the access to say this comfortably, if he is saying that the U.S. Air Force blocked access, then what that means is the UAPTF does not have a full picture. And what that means is, is that the report is based on an incomplete puzzle. And with all of that said, you can't say they're not ours. And that's where I would respectfully disagree. From a scientific angle, you need to challenge that theory. You need to look at everything, and that would be primarily 
the United States Air Force and their technology and their classified tech and stuff that they're doing. And are they testing here or testing there or testing when and so on and so forth. That's the evidence you need to challenge that theory on whether or not they are ours. So you can't say in one breath, the Air Force hindered the investigation. And in the next breath, aha, they're not ours. You can't have those go together. So that's what I would respectfully say. So hopefully that answered your your question appropriately. But I wanted to say for me, it's not about trusting or not trusting. It's about proving. And for for Mr. Mellon, there are certain things he said that are proven. There are other things like saying the extraterrestrial hypothesis is the way to go. That's not proven yet. And I think that based on his own words, you can't prove that. So that being said, D Voss, thank you for that question. Really, really appreciate it. Let me hit the phones again. You're live on the air. Who's this? Hey, this is Tommy Zito. How are you doing? Hey, Tommy Zito. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good. So I called in, one, because I wanted your opinion on something. Okay. And two, because I wanted to kind of share something cool, but only if I have, if I'm in your good graces, if that's possible. <laughs> uh, everyone's in my good graces. Why wouldn't you be? Or, or, or let me ask you this. Is the second part and the good grace is determined by the question you're about to ask me. No, no, oh, no, okay. no. I'm not, I'm not that, I'm not that cheeky. Oh, no, no, but, no. You're but fine. Close. Everybody's in my good graces. A- ask away. <laughs> right on. So, so I wanted to share something that I've been working on for a, for a while, for about two, a little over two years. Um, okay. It was really kind of after the whole, you know, 2017 debacle, right? Okay. Um, so I've been through this struggle of trying to get in touch with congressional leaders, specifically in my district. Um, okay. I'm from Colorado, mm-hmm. and the Colorado congressmen and congresswomen have been absolutely silent on this whole thing, right? Like, they have not uttered a peep about it, which was really frustrating for me. So I've gone down this rabbit hole of trying to get in touch with them, uh, you know, knocking on doors, leaving voicemails, sending emails, writing to them, never getting anything back. Okay. Number one, I, you have a lot of experience with engaging with the government. So one, I want your perspective on that. Like, why does that happen? Number one. Number two, um, I've been granted a 10-minute meeting with Congressman Ed Perlmutter on August 12th. Okay. Um, it's 10 minutes, so nothing that, you know, we can't go too deep into the topic sure. at all. But but I uh, kind of wanted to get your feel on, one, those kind of grassroots, boots-on-the-ground efforts. I think that's what you do every day. Now, and then number two, um, what would be the number one question that John Greenwald would ask in that situation? That's okay. Um, let me deal with the first part first. Why no response? I mean, that the, simply the stigma truly is there. It really is for politicians to get involved. I think what has changed in the last couple of years is they realize that, number one, the media is taking it seriously. But number two, they get airtime when they talk about it. So I'm not saying that all politicians or even former government uh, government officials that are talking about UFOs are doing so for publicity. Don't take me wrong. But they're politicians right. at the end of the day. And so I think that some of them see the value of it. Others are right. still stuck in that. Oh, my God, if I talk about UFOs, it's aliens and I'm some, you know, freakazoid politician and it'll ruin my career. That may have been true 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Not so much anymore. I think some politicians are, are realizing that while others are still kind of stuck in that that older way of thinking. They're very careful when they do talk about it, uh, but but very apprehensive. And some are just, you know, not not willing to talk about it at all. If I had one question on the fly, what I to answer, I mean, maybe if I thought about this a little bit more, I'll have something more eloquent. But for me is what are you doing? You know, what are you doing about this? Because, you know, to, to, to preface the question, the phenomena is real. The military is going on the record saying they have no idea what it is. 143 out of the 144 cases they acknowledge do not have a high degree of confidence to be solved. So what does that mean? And, and essentially, the military pilots, the men and women that are the best of the best in the world are coming forward. And I don't want to say they're fearful, but I think they're fearful. I think they're concerned that they are up there with whatever these objects are. And in most cases, they talk about them being three-dimensional and physical. And if they're three-dimensional and physical, they may have weapons. They, you can crash in them. You can collide with them. So there's a, there's a concern there. 
And so that's the long winded way of saying, what are you doing about it as a lawmaker and somebody who has constituents that are afraid about what truly is going on with this phenomena? And, and, and what are you doing about it? Because we know about Marco Rubio's committee and, and we know about some senators, you know, and congressmen asking questions. Uh, but if I had somebody that I wasn't aware of asking those questions, I would say, what are you, what are you doing? So I find that very interesting because that was definitely one of the things that I had in mind specifically because uh, Ed Perlmutter stands on a number of committees, uh, you know, as far as aerospace and science and NASA and national labs and things of that nature. So he seems like the perfect guy to get maybe some additional resources applied to that, right? So that's why I kind of went after him, number one. Number two, he also oversees my, my direct district. So he's the congressman respect, you know, responsible for sure. where I live and my zip code. Um, so I find that that's super interesting because I was kind of thinking the same thing. Yeah, um, I, I wish you all, you all the more? best and and keep in contact with me. Uh, you know, let me know how it comes out and we'll bring you back and we'll talk about the 10 minutes you had with them. Because I'm curious about how <laughs> the reaction would be you know, with that. Because, again, you, you have the norm that is talking about it, the Senate Intel Committee and stuff like that. Those are the ones that are in the spotlight, but I want to know about outside of that and, and the different names that are either are on the same committee or outside of that committee and how they're reacting to it. So, yeah, keep in contact with me and let me know how it goes. All right, will do, buddy. Hey, you have a good night. Thank you. You as well. Yeah, very cool. And I encourage anybody to, to, to essentially do the same, uh, and, and that is to... Write your congressman. Get involved. I mean, that really is. There's there's no art to it. Uh, that's their job is to present uh, the the will of the people. So uh, I always recommend to do that. I know a lot of people take part in those pe petitions and faxing campaigns and stuff like that. And although that may not necessarily be a bad thing to do, I think that that one on one uh, interaction is a, a good way to go. There was a journalist too that found a way to get into a lot of pressers during the 2016 election. And I remember I'm, I'm drawing a blank on his name and I talked to him a couple of times uh, and he found a way to ask those questions like, what do you think? What are you going to do? What would you do? And so on. And so I really, you know, I think that that's a, a good thing. Tons of questions here that came in text. Uh, as I, I told you with resetting the phone there and having the calls being able to come in, these just fall to the wayside and it's not for a lack of interest, but rather you guys are awesome supporting this channel. There have been a ton of people that have watched and taken part. So I'm going to deal with, this may not be working again. I'm going to deal with the text messages for a couple minutes, see how many I can get to. And then I may have to end this stream here in a few moments. So I'm sorry for the glitches here with the phone. And I know it kind of had to do some awkward pauses as we were, as we were uh, talking. But that being said, uh, that's live and I always expect some kind of blunder, but hopefully we'll, we'll get that. We'll get that solved. Uh, let me take this call real quick. Who's this? Hi, uh, this is Jim. Hey there, Jim. What can I do for you? Well, first it's a pleasure to speak with you, Mr. Greenwald. I've uh, been a big fan of your stuff for a while now. Um, Thank a question you. occurred to me the other day about the Robertson panel committee. Yes. And I just want to put this idea out there for you and your listeners. Um, and this is just based on my gestalt of the, of the overall situation surrounding that, that uh, series of meetings. The men who were involved were mostly, I guess what you could call professional paranoiacs. Their job was to be paranoid about everything. Yeah. And so they put this panel together that basically poo-poos the situation that tries not, among other things, tries not to get the other strata of the American cryptocracy to even look into this. That was part of their goal. And yet, when you look at the biographies of some of these people and the, the nature of the information they were confronting, the nature of the information that our secret government basically was confronting at the time regarding UFOs, you can tell uh, uh, that some of them strongly believed it was occurring and it was an unknown intelligence. And so what occurred to me is this, just how is it that professional paranoiacs 
like these men and the other men involved in our secret government at the time. Just how is it that they could, they could actually believe that these things are occurring and that it's from another intelligence and yet try to, to poo poo it, not just to the public in general, but to other strata of the secret government itself, the American secret government. Um, how could they feel comfortable doing that if some of them believed it was real? And, and just in my own thinking, the only thing I could come up with, given that the, what I've said so far is true, if that's true, the only thing I could come up with is that they had some form of communication lines that they believed were honest uh, to this phenomena. And, and when you think about men like Alan Dulles, and men like that, I mean, very low human qualities. Just how is it that they could trust anything, much less an alien intelligence? And, and strangers, strangest of all, how is it that they could be right? How is it that 62, 69 years later, they've, they're still right in that it hasn't done much threatening to us at all? And that's just a, a, a series of thoughts that I'd like to just throw out there for you and your listeners. Well, I appreciate that, and thank you, and lots of compliments to your voice in the chat room. So, uh, so thank you for, for for calling in and sounding good uh, for everybody and 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 your thoughts. My my quick reaction would be this: uh, in that, I think it may be an an assumption that they're sharing their beliefs throughout the intelligence community, and I think that paranoia translated more so to the general public's reaction. It's that war of the worlds scenario. And I think the paranoia was, was, was in full force when if, if they were gonna come out with something or let's say the Air Force concluded that UFOs did have this extraterrestrial connection, that that paranoia told that secret layer of the government uh, that, that played a role in the Robertson panel and hey, let's look at the evidence and figure it out that at the end of the day, they realized that that general public could be incredibly problematic, that they could overturn the infrastructure of, let's say, emergency responders, and everybody starts calling 911, and there's panic, and people start shooting to the skies. Uh, again, that War of the world scenario. So I think that that paranoia was, was absolutely rampant, especially in that era, and that that could have translated to them to tell the Air Force, look, it's not about science anymore. It's about you guys dispelling this myth, solving the solving the phenomena in whatever way possible and calming everybody down. And I think that that paranoia uh, was was there and, and whatever happened in other secret layers of the government, who really knows? But in my opinion, that's that's what happened. And that's when the true cover up began. In, in likely about 1952, 1953. I give the same analysis of when the true cover-up began. I guess uh, just to briefly skip to another subject, would you agree if this is an unknown intelligence that's been responsible for this for so long, that really both the, uh, the, the cover-up and the disclosure are really in its hands? What people are essentially saying with things like the AATIP report, that nine-page piece of dribble, mm -hmm. what they're essentially saying is, as long as this phenomenon does not prove itself to the worldwide community at 6 o'clock in the morning tomorrow, as long as it doesn't do that, we're going to go along with the mums the word thing. Yeah. And, and I think that they will continue to do the, the mums the word thing. And they, they will trickle out a little bit of... of information the public feels like they're getting something i was surprised i mean after i read the report a couple times yes it was ridiculously short and then it was a big letdown but you read it a couple times you realize there are certain nuggets in there but i think that the nuggets are just that they're nuggets throw those out to the general public and that'll buy them you know a, a, a couple you know more decades worth of of denying so so the next six months are going to be incredibly crucial to understanding will mum continue to be the word or is this somewhat of a turning point i don't know if they're banking on really annoying people like me who will go after every single 
piece of evidence that may exist when it comes to emails and, you know, attachments and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so there will be a lot of FOIA fodder, but the next six months I think are going to be crucial to understanding if, if, if mum will, will be the word, but Hey, I really appreciate your phone call, your thoughts. I hope you keep listening, calling again. Uh, but I, I really appreciate that. I'm sorry to, 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 to thank you so much, Mr. Greenwald. It's been a pleasure. No, thank you. The pleasure's mine. And, uh, yeah, great, great ideas. And I, and I think that I did a video about this. So if you're curious about that history, because to my surprise, the history has actually come up a couple times throughout the callers uh, on this show. If you're interested in that history, there's a video on this channel that goes into how the 1960s played out and how potentially we're seeing that play out again in a different way. And so I would recommend if you are interested in that to go look at that video. And, uh, and this will be a great time for me to remind you if you haven't done so already on YouTube, please give that thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn the notifications on. I don't know. Everybody on YouTube says that. So I figured I have to do that too. Uh, but joking aside, make sure you do that. Sharing and liking the video is absolutely one of the biggest uh, helps that you can give this channel. So thank you guys uh, for doing that. I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to round it up here in the next couple of minutes, but I've got somebody on the phone. I don't want to ignore, uh, you're live on the air. Who's this? I appreciate it. It's Don. Hi there, Don. What can I do for you? Hey, well, yeah, I know I had a question, uh, kind of a comment as well. Um, I'm always was curious of kind of how the government would avoid FOIA. Um, and I think kind of one of the ways that they do that is hiding things in private corporations. Um, was curious what your thoughts are on, uh, how, you know, Governments would avoid FOIA um, by hiding in private corporations, as well as uh, Bob Bigelow Aerospace, and kind of your thoughts on, uh, on what's yeah. going on with them. So that's a very common concern, and it absolutely is a concern when it comes to hiding information in the private sector. But I will admit, I think it's very much overblown, and I think that the concern is more inflated than it should be. And let me quickly explain why, and I'll use Bigelow Aerospace as the example since you brought them up. Bigelow Aerospace got the OSAP contract through the Defense Intelligence Agency. For those who don't know what OSAP is, you probably are more familiar with ATIP. Depending upon who you listen to, because there's differing opinions on what the connection is, essentially it was connected to a tip, right? So there's, there's a connection there. Mr. Elizondo has a differing opinion than Dr. Hal Putoff, who has a similar, but slightly differing opinion than the, the, the department of defense. So that's what I mean. Depends on who you believe, but regardless, they are connected in some way with that. The concern is that the money, let's say it's all a UFO or paranormal research program. Money gets dumped into the coffers of Bigelow aerospace and everything is gone. We don't see anything anymore. That's the concern. Here's why that's not warranted, though. Whenever a contract is awarded, you have deliverables. You have to have to essentially take that money, but produce something. You're contracted to produce something. And so when it comes to OSAP, what they produced were 38 reports. Ironically, none to deal with UFOs. There was one on the Drake equation and one that uh, was on the physical effects of, of, an, of encounters um, with exotic craft, but essentially like no, you know, real exposés on UFOs that you would consider on that program. That's always been a controversy. But those are what I mean by the deliverables, and those are FOIAable. What's also FOIAable would be the communications between Bigelow Aerospace and the Defense Intelligence Agency because the DIA would still be having a word in everything. They would continue to say, look, you need to do this, you need to do that. So they would still have those communications. Those would be open. Some people have argued with me and say, well, you're not going to get Bigelow Aerospace's emails. That also is not true because the minute they communicate with DIA, and I have proof of this, uh, that becomes a government record that's FOIAable because you are FOIAing the mailbox of, of whomever it may be. And so you can get access to those emails. I got a stack of Bigelow Aerospace emails through the FOIA based on just that. They were communicating with the FAA. So my whole point is there will be a lot that goes into the deliverables that, of course, you can't touch with FOIA. But those deliverables are going to be essentially the gold 
for that contract anyway. So unless you're like me, and I f I'm the first to admit that I love every single piece of evidence, in a situation like this, it kind of doesn't matter because you're getting the end result. You're getting what that contract was created for and what they were contracted to do. Uh, and then of course you add in the communications and you have a lot more FOIA fodder. So those allegations by others have, have always been a concern to me because it's just not grounded in, in fact, uh, that's more of a, I don't want to call it a conspiracy theory, but it, it's, it's more just like a, a concern by people thinking that you could hide things in the private sector. Uh, but when it comes to contracts, you can't hide everything. Now, it doesn't mean stuff's not going to remain classified or exempt. So yeah, you may run into pushback there. But regardless, it's still FOIA a bull. That is not to be conf confused with a grant. So if a grant goes out from a government agency to some company, then sure, that's that's a possibility. But when it comes to these contracts, no, there's still a lot of information to get. That would be my concern that yeah, there would be something like a grant or another uh, some sort of underlying writer to the grant contract proposition, whatever it may be. And with that rider, that kind of gives them the uh, excuse, if you will, to kind of throw in whatever they need to throw in to, you know, kind of tuck it underneath the, uh, the blanket. If yeah. You know what I'm yeah. And, and like I said, it's not to say that it, it wouldn't happen, but I think that, that a lot has to happen for that to happen for them to cover it up uh, in toto, you know, for them to be able to just cover up everything. And yeah. when it comes to, and I would hope, I mean, anything that, <laughs> anything that important and that serious that, that, you know, if they were doing any sort of electronic communication that, uh, that they wouldn't be doing anything electronic and there wouldn't be any sort of electronic records yeah. due to the, you know, the sensitivity of the, you know, the subject. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's a great question though. Hopefully, I I answered it for you. And and um and and like I said, for for those that are listening and aren't aren't aware, just to prove my point, just search theblackvault.com. Once you enter the site, search for Bigelow Aerospace, and you'll come up with those emails. But I really appreciate the call. Thank you. Hey, I appreciate your diligence. Thanks, John. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, a couple things. Somebody came in on the question mark. Was wondering where the alien head was. Yes, my son does come in. He does put random stuff. This is his drone, so he puts that. Sometimes you'll find uh, artwork back here. Uh, I just shot a television series in here, so everything got kind of pulled off because they rearranged everything. The alien actually is way up there now, just because it was in the shot a certain way. So they put it in to have it higher in the camera frame. Uh, so they were just here. They pulled furniture out of here. We had all sorts of equipments and lights. So sadly, offices get turned upside down <laughs> when that happens. So uh, that said, that's where that alien head is. But trust me, I'm sure you'll find it in a random spot sometime. Maybe we'll start a live stream. It'll be sitting in my chair for all I know. So who knows? But that's where that is. Bricktop, uh, thank you so much for that uh, donation. John, please look into Mark McCandlish. Thank you, sir. I am um, obviously recently passed away, which was uh, a little bit unexpected as far as I, I'm aware. Uh, but yeah, was starting to go after files and, and we'll, we'll see what those cases uh, come up with. But definitely an interesting individual. So uh, that, that said, I am going to have to end it. And I do apologize. I believe that there are still people that are in the queuing system. I apologize to you all. I don't know how many there are. Uh, but I do apologize. Just know these are so much fun for me to do simply because I learn a lot. I get to interact with all of you. You all ask great questions. Sometimes uh, I don't always have the greatest answer, uh, but that's a testament to you guys and, and the value of this audience. And I so much appreciate the great questions and those who, who want to push back on whatever I put out there, you guys have done so in such a respectful way. And I love that. I love the dialogue because I never claim to have the right answer, but always love talking about what the answers could potentially be. And you guys have always been, uh, been great with that. So, so thank you. And, and with that, uh, just a friendly reminder, please, if you can, you know, uh, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel. I joked about it earlier, but it is a huge, huge help to me. That way we can go ahead and, and grow the channel. And, and these chats will be even bigger. The phone lines will be even busier. I'll have to get a moderator in here. I did end up blocking a couple people. I, I was able to see that. Uh, but I think we're at that point. I'm going to need a little bit of help. So for those fans of the channel that you like to come and hang out on the live streams, if you're interested in moderating, let me know. The uh, contact email is pretty straightforward. John, J-O-H-N, at theblackvault.com. So again, John 
at theblackvault.com. That would be a big help to me simply because I saw some of those people in here. They come in, they chastise, and those that I saw I was able to block, but maybe I missed a couple. So that said, let's get some extra sets of eyes in here. It's getting pretty big. And, uh, and again, thank you all for that. So until next time, and some of you asked about that tweet I did today, it really was seriously just a well wish for this week to be good because I do have a feeling it is. It was not teasing anything. It wasn't trying to say, hey, pay attention. But I will say this, it doesn't mean I'm not going to publish anything. And hopefully we'll be doing another live stream here in the next couple of days. Uh, but again, you know, not everything is coded language. I just had a feeling this is going to be a good week. Uh, but yes, there is a story coming. So I'm not trying to, 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 to tease it or anything. Uh, but just know not everything I post is coded language or trying to blow open some huge story that's about to break. But rather, I really do feel this is going to be a good week. Uh, but pay attention for that next story. Thank you guys all for listening, watching, paying attention, calling in, texting. I'm sorry, this will probably be the last week I do the texting. It's just too busy uh, at this point. This is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we'll see you next time.